This is Software Engineering Radio, the podcast for professional developers on the web at se-radio.net. SE Radio is brought to you by the IEEE Computer Society and by IEEE Software Magazine. Online at computer.org slash software. Developers, are you ready? It's time to upgrade your data platform to InterSystems Iris. Choose your language. Choose your tools. Choose your environment. Collaborate, build faster, and deploy more efficiently. When you can make faster decisions, there's no telling what you'll create. Ready, set, code. Start coding for free. Visit intersystems.com slash try to try Iris. Welcome to Software Engineering Radio. I'm your host, Jeff Doolittle. In this episode, I am pleased to welcome world-renowned software architect and author Yuval Lowy to discuss his recently published book, Writing Software. Yuval, founder of iDesign, is a master software architect specializing in system and project design. He has helped countless companies around the world deliver quality software on schedule and on budget. Recognized by Microsoft as one of the world's top experts and industry leaders, he participated in internal strategic design reviews for C Sharp, WCF, and related technologies, and was named a software legend. He has published several bestsellers and numerous articles on almost every aspect of modern software development. Lowy speaks frequently at major international software development conferences and conducts master classes around the world, teaching thousands of professionals the skills required of modern software architects and how to take an active role as design, process, and technology leaders. Welcome to Software Engineering Radio, Yuval. My distinct pleasure, Jeff. Your book is titled Writing Software, but it's spelled R-I-G-H-T-I-N-G rather than W-R-I-T-I-N-G. Can you explain the wordplay and the reason for the title? And so the aim of the book is to write the broken industry that we have, the software industry. As I write in the preface for the book, almost every aspect of software development is actually broken. And what I aim in the book is not just write the industry, but hopefully uh, be the launching pad or bring about a software development renaissance. That reminds me of a claim that you make in the beginning of the book when you say specifically the software industry as a whole is in a deep crisis. So perhaps you can expound a little bit on the nature and causes of this crisis, as you put it. Well, it's easy to explain the elements of the crisis. It's deeper to explain the causes. So if you look at how we develop software today, every aspect, every element of software development is broken. Let's look at cost. Software costs too much. Now, when you say something costs too much, it's a relative term with respect to what? Well, the only way to quantify it is is with respect to the benefit to the customer. And we're past the point of diminishing return in software development. For example, almost everybody that uses Office 365 or 2019 would have been just fine with Office 2010 or 2013. Why? Because it was just good enough. But 2013 cost the same as 2010, and 2016 cost the same as 2010, and so on. So you're just sending money for nothing for these vendors. When in fact, the old software, if it was done right, is just good enough. In addition, the cost of software is not just the cost of writing the bits. It's the overall cost of ownership. And if you were to actually account for it correctly across seven, 10 years and multiple versions, the cost would actually be prohibitively expensive. In addition, the cost of doing changes to software is so much that every once in a while when a customer or manager asks developer to do something, they throw the hand in the air and say, we cannot do that. Now, cannot is a statement of feasibility. Well, in fact, if it's just code, you can write different code. But when they're saying we cannot do that, they're actually doing a statement of cost because they're saying, of course, we can do it, but the cost of doing it is going to be so prohibitive, it's going to be cheaper to just wipe the slate clean and do this whole thing again from scratch and do this one thing you're trying to do here, which Mm. means the cost of what you're trying to do here is expensive. And then there's time. Time means nothing for software developers. 
deadlines for most developers are these useless uh, things whooshing by as they are chained to their desks. <laughs> In fact, uh, you, you laugh. It's actually sad. If developers mm-hmm. meet the deadline, everybody's going to be surprised because the expectation is for them to fail. And how can you run a business and be viable in a world where time and money do not matter? I mean, you couldn't operate a hot dog stand this way. That makes then sense. there's requirements. Developers solve their own problems. In fact, developers routinely fail to communicate with customers. If customers give developers the correct requirements, everybody's going to be surprised again, which on its own is, is a whole other uh, enigma because if it's not a surprise that customers give you their own requirements, why does everybody fail to accommodate the failure to communicate with the customer, which is a whole separate question, and why do they fail to communicate with the customer? And side by side with unmet requirements and disappointment, there's requirements that are perfectly communicated, but developers simply decide not to do because it's, it's too expensive or it takes too long or they just don't know. And it, it's really puzzling how nobody takes into effect how the introduction of the system would actually change the requirements against which it is written in the first place. Then there's staffing. Often, not the same people that write the code maintain it over years. And the people that maintain it simply cannot make sense of the software. Most software teams have crossed the threshold of being able to make sense of the complexity of their own system. And so the system is completely unmaintainable and they try and solve problems or introduce an improvement and introduce new problems and new defects. And it's, of course, now it's some kind of a runaway reaction where uh, it introduce one problem, it solves one problem, introduce two additional ones and so on. And that just grinds people to nothing. And then we have uh, high attrition and burnout. And this just uh, heaved on people to the point that the stress level is so high, you see developers actually getting sick from work. And then there's, of course, quality. I mean, in software, the word bug is synonymous with software. It's, 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 it's almost, hey, I have a little bug over here. No, it's a hideous monster defect. I mean, even a little bug in a sensor can take down a whole jumbo jet, apparently. There, there are no little bugs. I mean, what nonsense it is to try and classify bugs. And if I were to tell the listeners that every project I was ever involved in, I shipped on schedule, on budget, with zero defects, I'm not quite sure which part of that statement would offend them more, but I suspect it's the fact that I ship with zero defects because in their mind, it is absolutely impossible to have impeccable software. And to make it even worse, none of this problem is actually new. People now spend their entire career in software land not seeing software done right even once. And so now something else has happened. They think that it's just impossible to have any other uh, level of existence. And so if you try and actually even improve things or suggest things, if they have already concluded it's impossible to do any better, you now start insulting their own intelligence. So they start fighting you as they try and actually improve things. So the status quo must be the way it has to be. The way it has to be. That's why I'm saying that this is a crisis. Every aspect of software development is actually broken. Hmm. And it's not just me saying that. Go to Google and type uh, software projects uh, success or failure rate, and you're going to see horrendous, horrendous statistics. Most software projects actually fail. They fail to meet their objectives, their commitments. Uh, the ratio of uh, projects that fail is uh, higher than projects that succeed. And even that is a misleading statement because the situation is so bad, companies and organization had to change the definition of success. Because if you can't clean up your act, either you clean up your act or you lower the bar. And so success in software today is defined as anything that doesn't bankrupt the company right now. You can fail it later. Your mistakes can destroy lives 10 years from now, but if some code leaves the building missing a leg with a black eye, well, that's actually okay. That's considered success. And so it is next to impossible to find projects today that are done correctly start to finish. So how would you respond to the person who might say, I agree that there are elements of a crisis, but the company that I'm working for is actually doing quite well and making significant margins, and we aren't experiencing the crisis the way that you describe it. How might you approach someone like that? And and maybe what would identify the fact that they actually are in crisis? Perhaps they don't realize it. 
which I think is kind of no, what you're, no, you're this expressing. Is, this is what Scott Adams, this is what Scott Adams uh, recently uh, dubbed loser sync, meaning in one word, it's the thinking of a loser. It's, he coined that term. And the reason it's loser thing is because, first of all, you can't say, I'm doing well, you could have done much better and you lost a lot of money. Mm. That's, that's something that's, that is probably implied. Sort of the what, the, the what is seen and what isn't unseen. The dog that didn't bark and all of that. Mm. But it's more profound than that. Mm. We do software today as if it's the dark ages. Meaning, if you look at the dark ages, most people had ugly, brutal, filthy, short lives. But you know what? They still had a good time and there is family, they had parties and they laughed, right? Right. Now, even in the dark ages, you had people that were way better off than other people. I mean, look at the warlord in the 10th century with the feast and the servants and all of that, right? You can say, I'm at the top of the world. I am the king. I am the best. Mm -hmm. And the problem is, it's, it's all true, by the way, and you're very successful. The problem is you're still a 10th century warlord. If you have to choose between being just a nobody in a 21st century or a 10th century warlord, I think you would choose the warm bath once a day and Instagram than being a 10th century warlord. So saying that you're at the top of the world and you're successful in a pitiful environment is absolutely the statement of a loser. Hmm. And maybe somebody who's not really caring about the state of the industry in general, but is content to take what's good for them, perhaps. Well, I'm very much in the Adam Smith camp that people should be egoistic and uh, egocentric. And if everybody acts towards their own interest, eventually the invisible hand makes sure that there's prosperity for all. Okay. So I'm not, I'm not that much that people say, okay, let's just fix the world. Especially you can't aspire to fix up the world like the whole industry if your room is messy, right? I mean, to me, it's just hypocrisy. People saying we should do this and we should do that and society should do this. But in fact, the house is a big mess, you know? Clean up your room before you pontificate for others how to do their job. If it isn't working at home, don't export it. Uh, for example, yes. Okay. So that's, I think, a good summary of the nature of the crisis. Well, Hopefully, there's an answer for how the crisis can be addressed, and I have a feeling you have some opinions about what those solutions <laughs> might be. <laughs> so if you abstract away the specifics of quality and schedule mm. and budget and maintainability and so on, at the root cause is a poor design. Mm. It's a poor design of the software system. It's a poor design of the project that was used to build it. It's a poor design of the team of the allocation of the people, of the way you built the system, all of that is poorly designed. Hmm. And what I propose in the book is a way or a methodology of fixing it. Now, it's not a silver bullet because there are no silver bullet. In fact, all of the ideas in the book require a lot of practice and a lot of devotion to actually get right. But it's also not just the one thing that I'm proposing in the book. And the reason is, if you have a multidimensional crisis, you need a multidimensional solution. You, you can't just fix one aspect. You can't just fix the, the design of the system and then everything else would be fine. It doesn't work this way. Even if you have the best system design and architecture, if the project doesn't have enough time or money to build it or the developers cannot build it, you will fail. Mm. Right. So everything has to be aligned for success. What you're recommending then sounds like an integrated and holistic approach to the software crisis. The word integration and holistic is, is, is a good step. I look at it as a formula, hmm. meaning to fix the software industry, you need to fix both the system aspects and the project aspect. So you design system, you design projects, and along the way would also design your own career and your teams and all of that would fall into place as well. I want to focus the remainder of our conversation specifically on system design so that we can give our listeners a sense of what your proposals are for designing systems. Where would you like to start that exploration? What's the, the most important element? Of I guess the most important thing is to discuss what not to do. Okay. And the reason we have to start there is because the what not to do is the prevailing modus operandi of designing software systems today. I'll be blunt, unless somebody has spent some time with me, they're doing it wrong. Almost every system I've seen in the wild is designed incorrectly. And so I guess the most important thing that we should discuss is that you should avoid what I call functional decomposition. So let's just explain those three words. 
architecture in general is an act of decomposition. You take a big nebulous idea and you break it down into smaller building blocks, components, services, whatever the methodology or the abstraction level is. That makes sense. Most people do functional decomposition. Functional decomposition means you look at the required functionality of the system and you decompose accordingly. You reflect in the architecture the required functionality. So if I give a requirement spec that reads 1.2.3 system should do A and 4.5.6 system should do B, you would have an A block, a B block, a C block. That is the kiss of death. If, if you did that, the project has already failed, past tense. The project has already failed before anybody wrote the first line of code. And why is that? So how much time do we have? <laughs> <laughs> so I'll give, you, I'll give you a few reasons why this is bad. If Every one of them is literally a nail in the coffin to kill it. But I'll save the best nail for last yeah. so we can discuss it in the light of what is the right way of doing things. So first, you're not going to get just three things to do. A decent size software system today may have 100, 200, 300 things to do. If you do true functional decomposition, you're going to have an architecture with 300 blocks. Mm -hmm. Now, 300 blocks is really, really the epitome of a bad design. And the reason is, while each block is small, doable, understandable, the integration cost of such an architecture is astronomical. Absolutely. And so we're talking about level of complexity that defy the mind. Now, you could do something else. You can have a component or a service and pump into it the A and the B and the C and the D. And you have these ugly dumping ground of functionalities. And you get these crazy monoliths of dooms. You can have two or three of them side by side sometimes. And the problem with that, while you don't have the integration cost of an explosion of little things, the internal complexity of those big things is also astronomical because complexity is not linear to size. Something twice as big is not twice as complex. It's four times as complex, mm -hmm. 20 times as complex, and so on. So the functional decomposition always lands you in these extreme areas of complexity that nobody can understand the intricate relationship between and inside and across components of your architecture. And if you don't understand your architecture, nobody can maintain it, extend it, reuse it. The other problem with functional decomposition is that somebody has to say to the system, do functionality A, do B, do billing, invoicing, shipping, whatever it is. And that somebody is the client of the system. But the notion that you need to do A and then B and then C is business logic. So now, all of a sudden, the client is infused, infuses business logic. The client has to know that you can't do billing if you haven't done invoicing. Now, every developer knows that you should never pollute the client code with business logic, and yet they're all doing it. And the reason is functional decomposition forces them to pollute the client with business logic. So now two things happen. First, the last thing you want is to maintain the business logic in two places, in the system, and in the clients. But since you have to put it in the client, you tend to beef up the clients and dumb down the system. So now you end up with the clients being the system mm. and some kind of a poor excuse or hand-waving for so-called services. Makes sense. The other problem is, what does it take to add a new client? So marketing waltzes into the office and say, we need to add a mobile device. The problem is, it's not just adding another client. It's a duplication of the system. Mm -hmm. And now you have to maintain the business logic in two places. And it's not going to be exactly the same business logic because of slight differences between the clients. And then you have to add a third type and a fourth type of a client. At some point, developers throw their hand in the air and say, we cannot take it anymore. No more clients. <laughs> the other problem is that because of the interaction between these areas of uh, functionality, suppose I have another system that needs to do just a particular functionality, just B, just billing. Okay. If you lift the B from one system, you can never drop it in another system because the A and the C is hanging off it because before the B you do an A and after the B you do a C. And the reason is functional decomposition is always time decomposition as well. You decompose based on a particular order. As a result, reuse does not exist in the functional decomposed system. Another problem is that as you enter the system to do the A, back to the client, B, back to the client, C, back to the client, you've entered the system in three places. And that means three places to worry about security and three places to worry about scalability, performance, availability, responsiveness, redundancy, throughput, performance. Everybody knows that a good design ideally would have a single point of entry, but should certainly minimize the number of points of entry. Functional decomposition always tends to maximize the points of entry. And with it, of course, complexity, because now you start smearing security. 
and scalability across all places in your architecture. Hmm. So points of entry are maximized, coupling sounds like it's maximized, and business logic gets spread out across the system, particularly in the clients. And complexity is maximized, right? Yes. Because of the interaction and the internal uh, complexity. But uh, you know what? You know, Jeff, I can prove to you that functional composition is the wrong way of designing system without using a single software argument. Okay, great. I'm going to use the first law of thermodynamics. The first law of thermodynamics simply states that you cannot add value without sweating. Now, we don't know quite why this is the first law of thermodynamics. There's nothing in Newtonian physics that says it has to be so. But it is. But it is. We know at least that on this side of the Big Bang, that's the way things are. We're not quite sure what happened before the Big Bang, but on this side of the Big Bang, the first law of thermodynamics rules the universe. And everybody knows that you cannot have a free lunch. I mean, that's another way of saying there is no way of adding value without sweating. Now, if you look at architecture, architecture is a hided value activity. Everybody's listening to us instead of doing something else because they value architecture. In theory, being able to have a system that's maintainable for a long period of time, that minimizes total cost of ownership, that is extensible, reusable, secure, these are all high added value aspects. Now, functional decomposition is fairly easy. If you have at least either an requirement spec or on a scrum board of all the required functionalities, the architecture is simple. No sweat, you say. I have an A block, a B block, a C block. But that's the problem. You said no sweat. Mm. Now you try and cheat the first law of thermodynamics because on one hand, you endeavor to add value. On the other hand, you endeavor to do it without sweating. And according to the nature of our universe, this is just not going to happen. And so here, I just proved to you that without a single software argument, you should never do functional decomposition. And yet, that is exactly what almost everybody is doing. So as you're describing this, this sounds like a horrible way of doing things. So why would anyone do things this way if it causes so many problems? The answer is very simple, human nature. Human beings cannot resist the allure of the free lunch. And this has nothing to do with software, right? I mean, let's look at a simple example. Let's look at alchemy. For thousands of years, people tried to turn lead into gold. It didn't work even once, and yet they commanded king's ransom. They were the smartest people in every kingdom, and every alchemist had their own unique way of mixing the potions and saying the incantations and so on. Zero results, and for thousands of years, the best practice was to keep trying this. Why? The allure of the free lunch. It's in our nature to do this. And, and unfortunately, this has nothing to do with intelligence. The greatest alchemist of all time was Isaac Newton. Mm. And most people are less smart than Isaac Newton. And yet Isaac Newton was an alchemist. He kept trying to find the philosopher's stone and so on. And so it takes iron will to overcome the desire to do functional decomposition. And that's actually the challenge in doing it. And you're doing what we're going to discuss, hopefully, how the right way of doing it, because everybody around you are going to be hell-bent on doing it incorrectly. But, you know, given the nature of the crisis in software, you basically be fighting insanity here, because the smartest man that ever lived said that the definition of insanity is doing things more of the same, but expecting better results. <laughs> and I, I expect the customer and the boss to want you to do things better. I mean, arguably, if you're doing a new system, the reason you're doing it is because the old system didn't work because you should be able to maintain your systems for decades. And yet you can't, and therefore you need to do something else, which is hopefully better. But how could you better do better by doing more of the same, right? And so Einstein said, that's the definition of insanity. And so you will have to fight the lunatics trying again to do functional decomposition. Yeah, and that's interesting when you mentioned it's not necessarily a measure of intelligence. It's just a measure of human behavior to do things the same way over and over again. That's right. And that being said, there must be a solution to this problem. And I have a feeling you have one in mind. <laughs> yes, there is. What I propose architects do is decompose based on volatility. Decompose based on volatility means architects should identify areas of potential change things that could change in the system 
and those you encapsulate in building blocks of the system. And then you provide the required behavior of the system as interaction between these encapsulated areas of volatility. Decomposing based on volatility is literally the essence of a good design. All systems around us are designed using uh, this principle. And the reason is when you start thinking about volatility-based decomposition, you start envisioning your system as a series of vaults. Each vault encapsulates some area of volatility. Now, when a change happens, a change is very dangerous. It's like a hand grenade. And yet you open up the door of the appropriate vault, toss the hand grenade inside, and close the vault. And the vault does boof. And whatever was inside the vault may be completely destroyed, and yet there's no sharpener flying all over the place, destroying everything else in the system. And put differently, you've contained the change. Now, if you look at functional decomposition, functional decomposition would maximize the impact of such a change. Because you decompose based on functionality, by definition, the change can never be in one place because your building blocks are associated with functionality, not with change or volatility. Mm -hmm. So now when a change happens, it is like tossing a hand grenade into your system and everything is torn apart. And that is the real reason why functional decomposition is so deadly. All the other things I said about it is just to whet your appetite. The inability to handle change is the kiss of death for any software system. Could you summarize that by saying that things that change together should live together in your system? There's, there's another layer here, mm. which we can get into, which is if, if you need to design software systems, you can ask yourself, are the common areas of volatility in typical software systems? And if you can recognize that in advance and you come up with a nice starting point for the design effort, but you could take it even a step further and you can say, are the typical interaction and relationship between these areas of volatility. And if you bring that into your design effort, then you already have some structure and you'll have to invent the wheel every time. And that is actually the nature of uh, all good design or all good architectures, that there is this very high level of recurring of self-similarity. So I wouldn't actually say live together. I would say that you should actually look for high degrees of symmetry and high degrees of uh, recurring architecture. Now, we're not talking about the actual details. For example, a mouse and an elephant have the same architecture. You agree about that? Yes. But the details are totally different. Mm -hmm. And so, and yet, if you know that you need to have a kidney, a liver, two lungs, and so on, then you're already very much on your way to designing a small little animal or a big animal, right? And so that's another thing that I discuss actually in the book. I discuss the structure you can actually put on top of software systems, but it's all driven by the idea of decomposing based on volatility, that you identify the volatilities, and then if you identify certain types of volatilities, they have this kind of structures in your architecture and they're allowed to do this set of interactions. Calling all developers. There's no telling what you can create when you upgrade your data platform to Inner Systems Iris. Are you ready to build the applications you want, however you want them? Are you ready to develop applications faster than ever? Collaborate, build faster, and deploy more efficiently. Tomorrow's next breakthroughs are waiting for you today. Inner Systems Iris Data Platform. Ready, set, code. Start coding for free. Visit innersystems.com slash try to try Iris. What are some concrete volatilities that might help our listeners have a better understanding of what that term means? So most of the systems implement some set of required behaviors. And... Note I didn't say requirements of functionality, I said required behaviors. It turns out that even the way most developers and marketing people phrase requirements is actually wrong because they use functional requirements. Functional requirements talk about the required functionality of the system. Well, in fact, what developers should really uh, receive from the customer or marketing is the required behavior of the system, how the system is required to behave. And the reason you want to focus on required behavior is because required behaviors are less open for interpretation than required functionalities. Required functionality, there's so many ways of doing any particular functionality, but the behaviors are much more close-ended here. You have to do it like this, like this, like this, and like this. So you can think of any 
required behavior as some kind of a sequence of activities. Once you understand that all requirements should be expressed as a sequence of activities, there's even a name for it, it's called the use case. Now, if all use cases are sequences of activities, then there's actually inherent volatility in it because the sequence could actually change. If I, ha if I have three activities, ABC, I can do it sequentially, ABC, I can do them all concurrently in parallel. Mm. Now I'm still doing the same activities A, B, C, and yet there's enormous volatility in the sequence. Or maybe I'm doing A first and then B and C sequentially. Or maybe I'm doing A and then based on a the condition, I'm doing B or C, right? So the sequence can be highly volatile independently from the activities. And so whenever you have this kind of volatility, I recommend you use a type of uh, service I call a manager, which encapsulates the volatility in the sequence. Now, even if you keep the sequence fixed, you can still change the activities because I could have a sequence of A and then B and then C. I can have a sequence of A and then D and then C. So I can change the activities independently from the sequence. And so volatility in activities, meaning all the ways of doing a particular activity is completely independent from the volatility of the sequence. And so once you understand that, you start looking for volatilities and activities, and I call those things in my structure and taxonomy engines. Now, all the business logic in the world typically operates on some kind of either state that you maintain or interacts with other systems that maintain your state. And so there's actually two additional volatilities here, which is how you access those resources. Mm -hmm. I mean, how many ways there are of accessing a database? 17? I mean, maybe more and counting, right? Right. And even if um, you fix the, um, the way you access something, what you access can actually change because I could access a file or a cache or a database and database can be local or remote or cloud-based. And so the resource that you access can be a queue, can be a database, can be a cache is also volatile. And so a whole set of volatilities exist in resources and also in how you access those resources. Separate volatilities exist in clients. Different clients can have different rendering technology if they present information to users or different uh, SDKs that they expose and different technologies that they use to expose the functionality of the underlying system. Absolutely. So that also volatility you need to encapsulate. A whole family of volatilities is something I call utilities. Every decent software system has infrastructure that it requires to survive. Things like security, message bus, queuing, diagnostic, instrumentation, profiling, logging. How many ways there are of doing logging? How many ways there are of doing security? And so the last thing you want to do is smear, say, the security volatility across all your components because when the security requirements will change, all your system will detonate. Hmm. And so you need to have utilities that encapsulate the infrastructure volatility, which has nothing to do with the required behavior of the system. Hardly any requirement spec contains specific requirements against the way you're supposed to do logging, right? That's internal to the system, but you have to do it along with diagnostic and instrumentation and so on. That makes sense. That makes sense. And so once you understand that there's these recurring patterns of volatility in software system, the next thing you can say, okay, are there typical interactions? Just as like typical volatilities are the typical interactions. Could you compile a list of do's, a list of don'ts, a list of always, of how these things interact with each other. Now, it's fairly abstract as, as I'm doing it like this, but at the end of the day, these are universal design principles. If you open your eyes, you will see that everything in the world around you is actually designed this way. For, for example, we, we are recording this webcast right now by integrating areas of encapsulated volatility. For example, the laptop I'm using is very different than your laptop. In fact, it is as unique as a fingerprint. There isn't a single laptop like it on the face of the planet. And yet all the volatility is encapsulated behind the microphone jack and then the HDMI uh, and the video card. And as long as it sends the video card to the screen and the audio signal down the wire to you, I don't really care what happens beyond it. It's, it's completely different than any other laptop, but it's encapsulated. I could not conduct this webcast and podcast if I were to care about the specifics of these things, right? If I look at uh, my heart, my heart encapsulates an enormous amount of volatility of pumping blood. You can have high pulse, low pulse, running, standing, 
walking, high adrenaline, low adrenaline, sure. with low blood pressure, mm. high blood pressure. And yet, I don't care because that volatility is encapsulated. I could not do any of my day-to-day activities if I cared about the volatility of pumping blood. And when you're driving a car, I can drive your car simply because even though your car is very different than mine, that volatility is encapsulated behind, say, the steering wheel and the uh, gas pedal and so on. And by the way, it used to be that these things were not encapsulated and then it was really, really difficult to operate these machines. Now, the nice thing about it is that I can actually change my laptop with no ill effects to my heart or my car. And, and I know it sounds strange because in most of the system, that's completely impossible. And yet, as long as I encapsulate the volatility of my laptop, my car and my heart are actually unaffected. Maybe my wallet is, but not my heart and my car. Okay. Sure. And so all good design decomposed based on volatility, meaning the encapsulate the inherent volatility of what is actually going on. You mentioned podcasting before and the fact that our laptops are not particularly made for podcasting, and yet here we are podcasting. So can you explain the relationship between this concept of encapsulating volatility and how real-world interactions actually emerge? So this is actually uh, one of the key concepts I have in writing software. It's an idea... I call composable design. And let me walk you back through this kind of a mental machinery of what this is actually all about. The mission of the architect is to design a system that addresses all requirements. By all requirement, I actually mean all requirements. I really mean all requirements. That sounds, present that and sounds future, daunting. <laughs> present and future, known and unknown. Okay. No, nothing less will do. Mm. You can't leave some requirements and say, well, I don't have it because I I didn't have enough time. You have to satisfy all requirements. That's where the bar is set. Nothing less will do. If you don't do it, then at some point in the future, the system is going to implode. Now, traditionally, people try to do it using some variation of functional decomposition. Now, by doing so, what they were actually doing, they were designing against the requirements. When you design against the requirements, the one thing we know the requirements do is that they actually change. And that's actually a good thing because if requirement wouldn't change, nobody here would actually have a job. No, none of our listeners, and other you nor me, by the way, would have a job because somebody somehow would write somewhere the software and that would be good enough. Mm-hmm. We're here because requirement change. And arguably, it's actually a good thing because there's so few of us and so many of them. So the more requirement would change, the better off we're all going to be. The other problem is that on, the reason you're laughing is because if you design against the requirements and the requirements actually change, then that inflicts a horrendous pain and horrendous cost because now your design has to change. And once, post facto, once you already have developed the system and deployed it, if you change the design, that is the most expensive thing you can possibly have. That sounds very painful. Every new requirement means a significant change across existing components or possibly even the creation of new components every time there's a new requirement. Is that basically what you're saying? That's the typical situation where you design against the requirements. And so developers, managers, and so on have literally learned nowadays to resent the change of the requirements because that inflicts pain and nobody likes pain. Now, the solution is so simple. It has eluded most their entire career, which is don't design against the requirements. <laughs> now, it sounds so absurd when I say it and you actually laugh, but I'm, I'm dead serious, right? right? Unless you like pain. If you like pain, keep doing it. Keep doing it. It's just fine. So the question is what you should do. And so the mission of the architect is to identify the smallest set of building blocks that you can put together to satisfy all requirements. That's the mission. Now, I really mean all when I'm saying all, all requirements, known and unknown, present and future. Any curved ball anybody could ever throw at you, you can handle. Now, this all must be confined within some sort of parameters, correct? No. No? No. It's all. all. It's all or death. All, all for <laughs> a particular business or all for ah, all businesses? Okay, okay. So, oh, hold on a second. So now, now we're getting to the gist. Oh, okay. So if you look at most systems, most systems don't just need to do three things. They need to do 100 things, 200 things, 300 things, right? Lots and lots of requirements. Now, requirements can be expressed functionally or behavior in the form of use cases, but there's a plurality of them, right? It's not, it's not one or two or three. So if you have... 300 things to do, 
or 300 requirements, it turns out that most requirements, most functionalities are actually not distinct and unique. Most requirements are a variation of other requirements. Most use cases are variation of other use cases. We have the happy case, the sad case, the incomplete case, the case we're just doing for that customer over there that paid extra. So let's actually define two types of use cases. There's core use cases and fluff. Core use cases represent the essence of the business. That's what brings the customer to the door. Fluff is, what, is, is all the other things. It turns out that all business systems have a very, very small number of core use cases. I encourage now the listeners to do a mental exercise and go and count in their head the number of truly distinct things their system is supposed to do. And most of it will come up with one, two, maybe three. And we find the number two or three to be very typical. We find the number four and five to be very high. And I've only seen six once. Hmm. And when I'm saying I've seen six, six once, I mean, it was a system designed for one of the largest companies in the world, a company that every one of the listeners has its product at home for a system that is actually a system of systems supporting the entire IT infrastructure that had 40 services and it was supporting 120,000 users 24 by 7 in five continents. You know, okay, you know what? Then you get six core use cases. Most systems have a very low number of core use cases. I've lost count of how many systems we designed at iDesign. It's in the many hundreds. We have never seen more than six. And like I said, six has only happened once. Typically, the number is two or three, maybe four. So it's not a very large number. What the architect needs to do is identify the smaller set of bidding blocks. And again, those bidding blocks encapsulate some areas of volatility that you can put together to satisfy all of the core use cases. Since all use cases are a variation of the core use cases, what they actually represent is therefore a different interaction between your building blocks, not a different decomposition thereof. So now when the requirements change, your design does not. And this is a fundamental observation. And I call this whole approach composable design. You never design against the requirements. You want to come up with a smaller set of building blocks that you can put together to satisfy all of the use cases. Now remember, the core use cases represent the essence of the business. The essence of the business hardly ever changes. And if it does change, it changes at tectonic pace, meaning it's really, really slow. Mm. Federal Express is in the business of shipping packages. It could move, move into ballistic missile control, but not instantly and maybe never. Possible, but not plausible. And if possible, incredibly unlikely and very slowly. Mm -hmm. And so by focusing on addressing the core use cases and have the smaller set of building blocks that you can satisfy all the core use cases with, now when the requirements change, what changes is the fluff. It's not the core. And therefore, all it expresses itself is a different interaction between your building blocks not a different decomposition thereof. So now when the requirements change, your design does not, okay? That is a fundamental observation about the design of things. There's plenty of examples. For example, the design of the human body was complete 200,000 years ago, meaning Homo sapiens appeared 200,000 years ago. Now, I'm pretty sure that being a software architect wasn't part of the spec at the time. And yet, I'm quite capable of being a software architect. Now, for most developers and architects, that would be a contradiction because how could you possibly have exactly the same design as a hunter-gatherer and yet survive as an architect? Most people would do functional decomposition and would design against the requirements. If they were to design somebody like me, there would be a box in me for everything I need to do. There would be a box, conduct uh, a conference session, write a book, drive to the airport, mow the lawn, kiss the wife, all the things I need to do. And yet I don't have a box in me called be a software architect or write a book. And yet I'm using exactly the same component as a hunter-gatherer. And the reason is while I'm using exactly the same component as a hunter-gatherer, I'm putting them together in a different way. And incidentally, the core use case hasn't changed. And there's just one core use case, which is survive. That's the only use case that I need to actually support. Everything else is fluff. You look at your uh, immune system. There's near infinite possible pathogens, bacteria, and viruses that could inf infect you and, and kill you. And your body cannot have an infinite number of antigens to actually go and fight it. So how does it actually work? Your immune system has a small number of components. It recognizes the invasion, composes quickly 
the correct uh, response to it and treats it. Everything is done this way. Now, when I have actually said before, I said that you need to come up with a smaller set of building blocks. That's actually a very key observation. You have to come up with a smaller set. And the reason it has to be small is because in general, less is more. You're not in the business of doing more work in the business of doing less work. You want to get away with the smallest number of building blocks, smallest number of lines of code, smallest number of everything. Now, if I give you a requirement spec with 300 building blocks in it, I could have a design that has 300 blocks in it. Well, that's, as we discussed before, a really bad design. And I can also come up with a design that has just one giant god block that does everything. Mm -hmm. Well, we've learned the hard way. That's not a good design. So somewhere between 1 and 300 is the smallest possible number. It turns out that that number, if, if we try and guesstimate what that number is, we can use order of magnitude. It's more like 1, 10, 100, 1,000. And I think everybody recognizes that number is more like 10 than it is like 100. So in orders of magnitude, it's more like 10. It could be 12, it could be 20, it could be 13. But it's closer to 10 than it is to 100. And the reason it's closer to 10 is because if the way you're supposed to provide the required behavior of any system, not just software, is by the interaction between those building blocks, then fundamentally, you're looking at how many possible combinations you have. Now, the number of possible combination of 10 components is on the order of 10 factorial, which is bazillion, gazillion, bazillion. By the time you're talking about 15 factorial, there's enough uh, combinations here for, like for every grain of sand on the planet. And this is even without discussing partial sets and repetitions. If I'm allowing that, the number is truly astronomical. Number of molecules in the universe. And the number of new molecules in the universe and such. And so three or five components is not enough because the factorial of three or five is not high enough. But by the time you have about 10 components, the number of combination is astronomical. And now anything you can throw at it, present and future, known and unknown, you're good to go. And this number, order of about 10, is another fundamental observation about the nature of things. For example, if I were to count how many components are in my body, I'm not talking about cells, I'm talking about components, liver, kidneys, and so on, it's about 10. And how many components are in your laptop? Well, I'm not counting transistors, I'm counting memory, CPU, graphic card, network card. Well, it's about 10. And how many components are in your car? Engine block, gearbox, water pump, battery, whatever it is, 10. Everywhere you look, you're going to find that number 10. And the reason is all systems have converged to that number because no system, even from an evolutionary standpoint, has any incentive of having frivolous components it doesn't actually need. You only have the smallest possible number of components that you can compose together to satisfy all possible requirements. Okay, That's the fundamental observation about how you design complex systems. You actually have very simple components that you can have near infinite possible interactions. Now, all of that leads to somewhere else. If you have a small number of components, themselves fairly simple, then suppose something changes. Suppose something changes in the business domain. Well, all you have to do is you don't change the components, you just change the way you put them together and you respond quickly to change. Now, Jeff, let me ask you a question. Isn't the ability to quickly respond to changes in the marketplace and in the business domain the essence of agility? Yes, and it sounds like what every software company would wish for, and every business for that matter. Every software company wishes for, every business is craving, Mm. and yet almost every software system is failing to deliver because they're designed against the requirements. And so it is almost diabolical. They try and respond quickly to the requirements by doing functional decomposition. Here's the A, here's the B, here's billing, here's invoicing. And by doing so, they absolutely guarantee the lack of agility because when a change happens, they detonate. It's diabolical. Mm. So how do our listeners begin to turn the requirements that they're given, which I imagine from my experience and theirs as well are often suboptimal, how do they begin to turn those requirements into what you describe as core use cases? So you may have heard something I never said. Mm. I said, don't design against the requirements. I didn't say you should ignore the requirements. Absolutely. You need them. Requirements are very important. Yes, you need them. Requirements <laughs> is where you identify the areas of volatility and the core use cases. Yes. So you have to invest in requirement analysis. As a result, this, of course, takes longer than functional decomposition. Functional decomposition, sure, transcribe it to a user story, tack it on the Kanban board, and away you go. Mm. I'm not saying you should do that. Do that eventually. Absolutely. If you want to do the 
process artifacts, then sure, do it. But you're doing it using the building blocks of composable design, which encapsulate volatility, right? Everything has to be in place before you can actually even do the first attempt of doing it. And it includes, of course, looking at the requirements. And in the book, I describe a set of analysis tools of identifying these errors of volatility. And I describe a set of um, techniques and postures even that you can actually put yourself in to make it easier to come up with these errors of volatility. Because remember, nobody would ever have a conversation with you on the requirement that sounds like this. Oh, we're going to change this. We're never going to change that. We're definitely going to change this. No, we're not going to change that. They're only going to talk to you about functionality and features. That's the only conversation you're ever going to have. And so what you need to do is take all of that input in. It's very important. But then start discerning and trying out of it the errors of volatility and the core use cases. The downside is that it takes longer than functional decomposition. And you're going to have to do it under fire because nobody understands these things. Everybody wants to get their features out. You're literally going to have to be fighting insanity because, again, they're all going to be hell-bent on doing it wrong, guaranteeing the pain. It has never worked before. They're going to hold hell-bent on doing it again, okay? Just like alchemy. And so the trick is, therefore, not just doing it. That's not good enough. Because if it takes you years to do it right, you're not going to get years. The trick is actually to do it effectively and proficiently quickly. Hmm. And in order to do that, you have to have a lot of practice doing it. So you still don't violate the first law of thermodynamics because you have to sweat enormously to get to that level of proficiency in professionalism so you can do it quickly. Okay? So you don't violate the law. You just don't sweat when it's time to actually do it. And that's the essence of true mastery. You know, and there's a saying that under fire, everybody sink to their level of training. If you try and figure out these things under fire, you're just not going to be very good. Sun Chu said that winners win, and then they go and fight. And that's the position you need to be at. So that's... I, I, wish, I, I wish I could promise the listeners just a magic bullet. Oh, just one, two, three, do it my way, the bing, the boong, you'll be fine. It doesn't work this way. This, in fact, is the hallmark of quacks. Quacks promise you an easy win. No, there's no easy wins here. And you mentioned before that you're not proposing a silver bullet, but if anything, it sounds like this is a rigorous engineering discipline where you're breaking down the problem into a composable design where each element of the design, it encapsulates those areas of significant change or, or volatility and it's putting them together that causes the features and the requirements to be addressed. Exactly right. Exactly right. But you know, is it instant to be a good engineer? It takes training, it takes education, it takes practice. It takes mentoring, it takes practice, right? Is it, is it, look, our basic expectation of professionals, be it engineers or doctors or lawyers or pilots, is that well-versed, they know their trade by heart, and that they've practiced relentlessly to be very good, right? The last thing you want to do is be patient number one of a doctor, okay? And nobody would really want to fly with a pilot uh, that just learned how to maneuver correctly, right? That, that's not a good idea, right? You want to fly with somebody that has 10,000 hours, okay? That's a good place to Absolutely. be Absolutely. And that reminds me of something I've heard of before called the 2% problem, which is you can never be good at something that you spend 2% or less of your time on. That's something that I, I coined, the 2% problem. Did you coin that? You're kidding me? Of course. <laughs> oh, that's funny. <laughs> that's hilarious. So now the architect has designed these components, and each of these components is encapsulating some area of volatility. But I can almost hear the product managers and the other managers saying, where are my features? So it turns out that features are always and everywhere aspect of integration, not implementation. It's a universal design rule, and it is a fundamental observation about the nature of the universe again, which is what makes it a universal design rule. So, so what do I mean by that? If you look at the podcast right now, if you need to provide a feature called the podcast, where is the podcast? Is it in the microphone? Is it in the keyboard, in the screen, in the laptop, you cannot point at any one thing and say, that's what the podcast is. You have to integrate the laptop, the microphone, the uh, streaming devices, the servers, all of that has to be integrated 
to get the podcast. There's never a box you can say, huh, that's where the podcast is. You have to integrate things. Okay, so now let's look, say, at my laptop, which I'm using to record this podcast. The laptop actually doesn't know that there is a podcast. The laptop only needs to send to your server now some kind of audio signal. So as far as the laptop is concerned, there is one feature here, which is send an audio signal. That's it. However, there is nothing in the laptop itself that actually provides that. I have to integrate the CPU where uh, the calculation is done. I have to integrate some files for running the operating system. And I have to integrate the uh, sound card. And all of these things to be integrated to send you the sound. There is no one box in the laptop that says send sound. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I mentioned, say, uh, the hard drive. The hard drive is storing a bunch of data required for it. Now, the hard drive doesn't actually know about sending files and sending sound. The, the hard drive is providing a feature of storing stuff. So as far as the hard drive is concerned, the feature is storing. Okay, so if I look at how the hard drive is done, is there any one thing in the hard drive that's doing storing? And the answer is no, because the hard drive itself has little memory chips and it has a small box that it has a little screws that's holding some kind of uh, media. It has its own power regulators and so on. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if I look at the little screw that's holding the frame of the hard drive together, it doesn't know anything about storing files. As far as the screw is concerned, the screw is providing one feature, which is fastening things. But is there one thing in the screw that's doing the fastening? No. You have to integrate the stem of the screw and the threads of the screw and, and the head of the screw and the torque to get the feature of, fa of fastening. Now, you can drill this way all the way down to the quarks and you will never see a feature. Interesting. So basically what you're saying is, well, actually, what that brings to mind is a fractal that's self-similar at all the layers. It is exactly a fractal where every layer in a fractal provides its feature as an aspect of integration, but never implementation, because you can never actually implement a feature. You always offer the feature as aspect of integration, not implementation. Hmm. So the screw seems like a really helpful concrete example there, because the screw itself does not have the feature called fastening, and yet the nature of the way the screw is designed in conjunction with the the threading that you screw it into, it's that integration of those two parts that provides you the feature of fastening two things together. Is that correct? Right. Is that what you're saying? Yes. And again, we we're, now we're zooming out. If you look at the hard drive, there's the single thing in the hard drive doing the storage. You have to integrate the screw, the media, the power regulator, the box. All of that is to integrate it to the storage. And if you look at the level of the laptop, there is a single box in the laptop doing presentation or sending an audio file. I have to integrate the graphic card, the CPU, the hard drive, the bus, the memory to do that. And you keep going like this. Hmm. So you mentioned before that idea of, uh, I'll just summarize it and call it the law of 10, that in every system, there tends to be about an order of magnitude of 10 components. But as we're drilling down, and maybe this was a question in listeners' minds before, as we're drilling down, we're probably finding another layer within each of those individual components of 10, order of magnitude of 10 at the next level. And then if you drill down into one of those. That's right. And at some point you reach the standard model of quarks, which <laughs> last time I checked is 22 things in it, which is also order of 10. Okay. Hmm. Absolutely. Now, as architects, we don't actually deal with quarks or with screws. As architects, we actually deal with overall system architecture. Mm -hmm. Okay where these things are far uh, more uh, concrete and discernible and, and, and not as granular as individual screws, right? So, we, But I'm just showing you that everything in the world is actually put together this way. Yeah, that makes and sense. And you can go up or down, and you will never actually see a feature. Well, this is some heady stuff, and I think our listeners are going to have uh, a lot of questions and possibly desire to explore more deeply. So as we're wrapping things up, is there anything else we missed that maybe you'd like to mention in the time we have left? Yes, what's coming next? <laughs> so as soon as you design the system without losing a heartbeat, you must design the project to build it. Hmm. It doesn't matter how good is your design. If you don't have enough time or money, or if the project is too risky, you will fail to deliver the system. So just as you have to design a system, you have to design the project to build it. 
And it may come as a complete shock to you to learn that people are doing it wrong. And you can make exactly the same argument about system design and project design that you should never do what they're doing today in project, but instead you should do something else. And we can have a whole different podcast on how to design projects. And I imagine that just how you had some opinions about how to uh, improve on system design, there are also approaches and techniques for learning how to correctly do project design. That is very true. And as you said, as we're in the interest of time, we'll have to move on and leave that at that. But thank you so much for your time. And if people want to find out more about what you're up to, where are some places they can get more information? They can always go to writingsoftware.org and learn more about the book or buy the book. And hopefully at some point we're also going to start, because like you said, these ideas are hard to come to terms with, hard to wrap your head around. And so we may be, we're considering launching a series of uh, book clubs, which are going to be guided reading by us at iDesign of the ideas in the book. Okay. So that's writingsoftware.org, uh, spelled R-I-G-H-T-I-N-G, putting write, writingsoftware.org. Right. Writing up the industry. Exactly right. Okay. Well, you've all, thank you very much for joining me to discuss your book, Writing Software. It's been a fascinating discussion. Thank you, Jeff. See you next time. This is Jeff Doolittle for Software Engineering Radio. Thanks for listening. Developers, take your marks. It's time to upgrade your data platform to InterSystems Iris. It's time to deliver complex mission-critical applications in the fastest route possible. It's time to use any data from any source. It's time to embed analytics and create interactive user interfaces. So what are you waiting for? Choose your language. Choose your tools. Choose your environment. Collaborate build faster, and deploy more efficiently. Done and done. Tomorrow's next breakthroughs are waiting for you today. InterSystems Iris Data Platform, the fastest way to build applications. Ready, set, code. Start coding for free. Visit intersystems.com slash try to try Iris. Thanks for listening to SE Radio, an educational program brought to you by IEEE Software Magazine. For more about the podcast, including other episodes, visit our website at se-radio.net. To provide feedback, you can comment on each episode on the website or reach us on LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, or through our Slack channel at seradio.slack.com. You can also email us at team at se-radio.net. This and all other episodes of SE Radio is licensed under Creative Commons License 2.5. Thanks for listening.